Hi everyone, this is the second part of a five-part series of podcasts about the ANZAI Science Program at the Antarctic Research Centre. I'm Matthew Wood and this is Journeys to the Ice. Antarctic Climate Drivers is the first of the three research streams of ANZAIS. This research group delves into the ultimate causes of Antarctic climate today and through time and assesses Antarctica's capacity as a driver of regional and hemispheric climate and of global environmental change. The 50-year record of Antarctic meteorological measurements is extended back through time by means of climate proxies within the layering of high-resolution ice cores. The resulting history provides a detailed account of climatic and environmental change, allowing the assessment of just how vulnerable Antarctica's ice shelves, and therefore also its ice sheets, actually are. Nancy Bertler, who works under the umbrella of the Joint Antarctic Research Institute, is a national authority on ice core research and leads the Antarctic Climate Drivers Group. Hi Nancy, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, hi mate, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So the name of this research group is Antarctic Climate Drivers. Could you begin by explaining this title for us? Because I'm wondering, does it mean that you're looking at the ultimate drivers of Antarctic climate or that you're looking at Antarctica as a driver of, say, regional climate? It is both. Antarctica has two fabulous characteristics for scientists to study. it. One is that it's a fantastic archive of past climate variability, and that really helps us to understand the climate system and to inform us on how the climate system might behave in the future. But the other is that Antarctica will play a major role in any future climate change that we will be experiencing. So we need to know both, really. We need to learn from Antarctica and we need to study how Antarctica will change future climate as well. I guess in the climate system, it's difficult to define exactly what drives what. You know, when you try and unravel these causes and effects, it's easy to sort of end up chasing your own tail, I guess. For example, here in New Zealand, our climate is obviously influenced heavily by Antarctica. But then in your work, you've shown that at least parts of Antarctica show climate signals driven by processes in the tropics. The complexities of the system mean that it's hard to study holistically. So it makes sense to split it up into the constituent parts and study them individually like you've done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the climate system is very interconnected and a lot of it we only observe, we know empirically, but we actually don't understand the drivers. We don't know the thresholds. We don't know what makes certain things change. But I think in science, we always try to be reductionists. We always try to identify certain pathways, certain forces, certain mechanisms that we can understand. And ultimately, what we really want to do is reduce the climate system to something that we can, you know, limited human brains can understand and have an idea what we might expect in the future. And so we do this by isolating certain forcings and then trying to use, for example, climate models to then see what these forcings could do as we change certain parameters. But of course, that always neglects a huge part of the rest of the climate system. And so we normally find as we study the past that, of course, the story is always much more complicated and often quite surprising. Okay, so in Antarctica, we have around five decades of direct meteorological measurements. And when we look at all these measurements over this time, we see an undeniable overall warming trend. But some areas are warming faster than others, and some are even cooling from time to time. Could you talk about some of the anomalous areas of Antarctica with regard to temperature change and how your work has contributed to this understanding? So one thing that's really important to appreciate is how fast Antarctica is and the very different region that it covers. So the latitudes as well as the different parts of being connected to the Atlantic Ocean, to the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And therefore, we often see Antarctica as one coherent or one homogenized body. But it is, of course, if you think about, for example, New Zealand and the different types of climates that we just experience across the two islands, if you project that onto Antarctica, you wouldn't expect that Antarctica as a whole has a unique or a single climate history. And so that in itself wasn't such a surprise, but you made a very important point, and that is we only have 50 years of observations. And these observations come from a very limited number of stations. So I think it's about seven that go back to 1957, the geophysical year, where we had the first stations develop long-term projects in Antarctica. And a lot of them happened to be along coastal sites that were logistically easier to excess and only two South Pole and Vostok were stations that were in the Antarctic interior. So there's already a bias that we only have two observations that are 50 years long from the interior of the Antarctic. So until very recently, the thought was actually that 
East Antarctica was cooling and that West Antarctica started to show the warming trend of the rest of the globe. But because of its polar position and the geography of Antarctica, there's some other very strong climate drivers that can modulate this global trend. One is what we call the Southern Enya Mode, and this is the strength of the westerly winds. And anyone in New Zealand will appreciate the westerly winds being a particularly important feature of our climate system because it brings the rain, it separates a dry east to a wet west in New Zealand, and it circumvents Antarctica. And the stronger these winds blow, the more isolated Antarctica becomes. We know that the ozone hole had significant effects of making these westerly winds stronger because it made the temperature gradient between Antarctica and the tropical regions stronger. And that meant that Antarctica was even more isolated. So some of the cooling that we saw in East Antarctica was due to the ozone hole making these westerly winds stronger. At the same time, because these westerly winds became stronger, they have a tendency to blow across the Antarctic Peninsula and then subside on the other side of the Antarctic Peninsula they made the Antarctic Peninsula quite a bit warmer. And so we had this very strong separation of the Antarctic Peninsula being one of the fastest warming areas on the planet, while East Antarctica still seemed to have this cooling. And this is really where the ice core data were extremely helpful, because ice core data, in a sense, are very detailed diaries, perhaps, of past climate conditions. So you can go to various places in the Antarctic, collect these ice cores, and reconstruct what the temperature was like, very similar to what the weather stations do right now. And from that picture, we can extend these temperature records and also fill in these big geographical gaps where we have no data, together with more recent satellite data that we now have for about 20, 30 years. We could establish that West Antarctica as a whole is warming very strongly and that even East Antarctica now is warming against that trend of having stronger westerly winds. So I guess we have climate drivers that operate on different timescales. And so the warming is a long-term, low frequency, so sluggish warming that continues to happen versus things that change quickly, such as the strength of a wind system, can have a, a short-term effect that that might be mediated, and that's exactly what we see in Antarctica. And in terms of absolute numbers, what magnitude of warming has been documented by historical measurements? In the case of the overall background warming compared to, say, the anomalous warming in West Antarctica? The areas of warming has quite a geographical pattern across Antarctica. And so East Antarctica, for example, shows a significant lower degree of warming than West Antarctica or the Antarctic Peninsula. And the degree of warming depends somewhat on your statistical tool, how you interpolate those sparse data and how you take into account that, you know, there's sometimes weather stations that do not record for a couple of months because there was a battery problem or something. But overall, the Antarctic Peninsula has warmed by as much as five degrees which is more than any other place, including the Arctic, in the world. West Antarctica, there has been new research that has been published in 2009 that suggests it's actually warming even faster than the Antarctic Peninsula. There's possibly some uncertainty around this yet, and the authors have explained the uncertainty in great detail, but it appears that there's a very good basis for assuming that West Antarctica is indeed very vulnerable. East Antarctica, on the other hand, seems to be, because it's so much colder, it's also very high. The average altitude of East Antarctica is around 3,000 meters. It's slightly less vulnerable to warming as areas that are lower level and closer to the ocean, which are closer to a zero line degree change, which is a quite a critical temperature change. One thing that is uniform to all of Antarctica is when we look somewhat high up in the atmosphere, and that is the metroposphere. This is an area where a lot of the chemical processes occur and therefore quite important for feedback mechanisms in the climate system. And research has shown that in winter, the metroposphere of Antarctica is warming faster than any other part of the globe, and that is across all of Antarctica. That was a very big surprise to scientists and certainly caused quite a bit of concern, both in the modeling communities, because they can't capture that warming in their modeling. So there's already some suggestion that maybe the models aren't quite adequate to capture the driving forces of this warming. But the other is that because it's such an important area in the atmosphere for chemical reactions, that there might be quite a few other feedback mechanisms that are put into place where we have very little understanding of how they react and how they work in the, in the climate system as a whole. So with regard to these high-resolution ice cores that you collect, how high-resolution are we talking? What kind of records have you typically been able to capture? We work in unusual sites for 
collecting ice cores, we go to the coastal regions. Most ice cores that people will have heard about come from the interior of the ice sheets, such as Greenland or Antarctica. And these are these really long, amazing records that go back almost a million years. By going to the coastal regions, we get much shorter records. They're only at length maybe something like 40,000 years long. But what they do experience in comparison to the interior is a lot more snow precipitation. And snow is good news for us. The more snow there is, the higher resolution the record is. So if you think about on the coast, we might get a meter snow precipitation per year. Then this is a whole meter per year recorded in these cores representing a particular year through time. Versus if you go into the interior, you might only get three centimeters or so of snow per year, but of course a much longer record. Our sites are most of the time at least seasonally resolved. So we have summers and winters and we can distinguish what the winter temperature, for example, two or three hundred years ago was as opposed to the summer temperature. But in some sites, the resolution is so continuous and high that we can even see things that happen as quickly as perhaps in a couple of weeks. We might not be able to date them as precisely, but we can date the duration of these events. So while we might not be certain if it was the first or the second week in March 200 years ago, we still can say that the event itself was about two weeks long. This kind of information is really helpful to understand processes. So, for example, what the CS was doing, at which point atmospheric circulation pattern have changed and how that might have related to other drivers, such as you mentioned earlier on, the tropical forcing, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. How much delay is there? Does it take one month or three months until the signal transmits to Antarctica? So these are extremely high-resolution records. Compared to the East Antarctic ice sheets, though, these coastal glaciers are very small localised accumulations of snow. How can ice cores from these sites give you information about the area beyond the glacier or even about the atmosphere as a whole? There's a whole range of proxies that we can look at, and some of them are very local proxies and others have global significance or hemispheric significance or Antarctic-wide significance. So we choose the sites very carefully to answer certain questions, and these questions vary with the time frame that we're looking at as well as particular climate drivers. So one climate driver that we're particularly interested in that's a feedback in the climate system is sea ice, for example. And it might surprise people that you can use an ice core to say something about something that happens in the ocean. But if you think about that, anything that has a residence in the atmosphere, so anything that passes through the atmosphere, can be captured by a snowflake that builds in the atmosphere and then precipitates out. We measure pretty much almost anything that is captured in this water. So from the chemistry to isotopic ratios of the water to the dust and even the gas bubbles that are eventually enclosed in the ice. And so, for example, to reconstruct something about sea ice, we're using the help of some microbes that are living in sea ice. These microbes produce something that is called DMS. It's a mesonate acid. This particular acid turns into what we call MSI. And MSI is something that we can measure with instruments once it's captured in the ice. The amount of acid in our sea ice directly correlates to the activity of these microbes. And because the microbes are living in the sea ice, they turned out to be a very good indicator of how much sea ice there was. And so, for example, Rachel Rhodes, a PhD student of the group, has done some very nice analysis where she compared satellite imagery of those plankton blooms that you can see in satellite images, correlated that to the sea ice extent and to the amount of MSA that she found in her samples and found a fantastic correlation that now makes it a very powerful proxy for us to look back in the past where we do not have the convenience of satellite observations to say something about the extent of sea ice. So ice cores can give you climate records back through time, but another important aspect of your ongoing fieldwork is monitoring the mass balance of these coastal glaciers. Could you explain this concept of mass balance and how you can apply it to not only small coastal glaciers like yours, but to whole ice sheets as well. So for a lot of people that look at glaciers or an ice sheet, they think of something very rigid, like a piece of ice cream that sits in the freezer. But really, if you had time to look at them long enough, which none of us has, of course, you would see they move like rivers, but very slow rivers indeed. The speed with which they move normally depends on how much snow accumulation they have because the pressure of the snow that falls on the ice sheet is displacing the ice to the floor, to the ocean. If there's as much snow falling in the interior of the Antarctic as is melting and ablating at its edges, we say that the ice sheet is in balance. There's an equilibrium. However, this equilibrium can be disturbed. It can either be that suddenly you experience a lot more snow accumulation, 
in which case the ice sheet would grow. And of course, that's happened through the ice ages when the ice sheets became much larger and the temperatures were colder, so there wasn't as much melting anymore. But the opposite can also happen, and that is that you suddenly have a lot more melt than the snow accumulation is providing, and then you end up with a negative mass balance and the ice sheet is shrinking. And what we now experience is the ice sheets are shrinking due to more extensive melt and also a reduction in snow precipitation. And of course, adjacent to these ice sheets are the numerous ice shelves, that is continental ice that has flowed off the land and into the sea. Now, in recent decades, we've seen the collapse of an alarming number of these shelves. Ice shelves are floating, you know, they're already displacing their seawater equivalent, so by themselves won't contribute to sea level rise. So what's the cause for concern? Ice shelves have a very important role for the ice sheets, and that is that they buffer the ice that is sitting on the continent. So while they're floating pieces of ice that are leaving the continent and floating out to the ocean, if you take these ice shelves away, what we have observed through the recent collapses of ice shelves in the peninsula is that the ice behind it is accelerating into the ocean. And so while, as you said, the ice shelf itself is not adding to sea level increase, if you allow the ice that is grounded and is now coming from the continent into the ocean to accelerate into the ocean, that of course adds significantly to sea level increases. And it's really important to keep in mind the proportions that we're talking of. So for example, just a 1% change of this mass balance of accelerated flow into the ocean could result in as much of, of 60 centimeters change in sea level rise. But so far we have seen these collapses happening around the Antarctic Peninsula, which is one of these areas that is experiencing particularly high warming. And there's two areas in the Antarctic where we are particularly concerned about for future warming. That's, of course, the Ross Ice Shelf, which is the biggest ice shelf in the Antarctic, and also in the Weddell Sea, the Weddell and Ronne Filchner Ice Shelf. And so our research is interested, like many other groups as well, to establish the health status of the Ross Ice Shelf, because the Ross Ice Shelf does the same buttressing effect that these little ice shelves have in the Antarctic Peninsula to a very substantial part of West Antarctica. So if the Ross Ice Shelf were to disintegrate, this would have rather substantial consequences in terms of the flow of ice from West Antarctica into the ocean. So in the worst case scenario of losing the whole of the West Antarctic ice sheet, what kind of sea level change could we expect? Well, if all of West Antarctica were to melt and that certainly wouldn't happen overnight, but if it would melt uh, somewhere between five and six meters of sea level increase worldwide. So it's a substantial amount of water that is capsulated in West Antarctic ice. However, in terms of recent measurements, there's another significant worry that we have with West Antarctica, and that is you can either accelerate ice into the ocean and increase sea level with that. You could melt the ice and increase sea level with that. But also you can float ice that has previously been bounded to the ground. Most of the West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded below sea level. And there's two particular areas in West Antarctica where ocean water could make it underneath the ice sheet. And again, if the Ross Ice Shelf were to disintegrate, that would be one area. And another area is called the Pine Island region, where a much, much smaller ice shelf is already retreating. If the ocean water was to get underneath in this graven system from West Antarctica, you wouldn't need to melt the ice to have an instantaneous increase in sea level because you would just lift ice that was sitting on a continent and would let it float in an ocean. And so this is another worry that we have with the disintegration of ice shelves. In terms of mass balance, the extra time series that we have from satellite observations are very short. But what we have learned from these very short time series is that the contribution of mass balance or the acceleration of the melt of the ice sheets has doubled in the last five years. So, so far, the ice sheets only contribute a relatively small amount if you think of it as a per year contribution. But with the acceleration doubling the contribution, there's a very good number out now that it's about two millimeters per year. Well, if you think about two millimeters per year, you might think, well, you don't really need to worry about it. But of course, if you were a city planner and you think in a hundred year time frame, then even if there was no further acceleration, you would have to consider a two meter sea level increase just with the status quo. And in order to investigate that very important Ross Ice Shelf, I hear that ANZICE is involved with an upcoming New Zealand-led international project based on Roosevelt Island. We're very excited about the opportunity to go to Roosevelt Island. Roosevelt Island is an island that's just at the northern tip of the current Ross Ice Shelf. 
And we're hoping through site survey work that's already being conducted that we get a very highly resolved record for at least the last 40,000 years, where most of that could quite likely provide us with annual resolution. This is really important because the Ross Ice Shelf has retreated over the last 30,000 years when we came out of the last ice age and the ice sheets shrank. The ice shelf itself retreated too. The retreat behavior of the ice shelf is very poorly known and it's unlikely to be a very steady state behavior, but rather it possibly happened in jumps that certain thresholds were achieved and then part of the ice shelf disintegrated and the ice shelf retreated further southward. With the Roosevelt Island site, we are at the right location to see these changes in the ocean and the interplay between the ice shelf and the oceans to reconstruct how quickly under which temperature regime that ice shelf retreated back. And with that, hopefully learn what it will do in the future as we keep increasing the temperatures of the ocean and the atmosphere. This is really important because it will allow us to establish how vulnerable West Antarctica is. So if we know under which temperature scenario in the future, depending on our own choices, what we will do in the next 100 or 200 years, how the Ross Ice Shelf will respond to that, and with that, how stable West Antarctica is, we hopefully can provide data that will be very useful for governments to both prepare and adapt to these changes that might occur. So after a decade of working on the ice, is it fair to say you're excited about having plenty of fieldwork still to do? Oh, absolutely. I feel very privileged to be able to go to the Antarctic. The Antarctic is an amazing place for scientists to work at. It answers some very important questions and it is, in my mind, one of the most beautiful, unexplored and rather pristine places in the world. For more journeys to the ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice.